Next speaker is uh, Ray Kokailang. Ray is a research geophysicist at the USGS Spectroscopy Lab in Denver, Colorado. Since 1996, his research has focused on the development of spec spectroscopic remote sensing methods for geologic, geologic, biologic, and environmental studies. He received a BS degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Austin in 1991 and an MS in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder in 1993. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to touch, hope the results of this talk touch on three trends in the last decade in imaging spectroscopy. Uh, the expansion from a lot of mid-latitude studies up to higher latitudes, uh, the rising use of uh, laboratory level or indoor scanning, things like core scan, and then some of the more, well, one of the more recent developments, uh, field based scanning of outcrop. And let me grab that from you. Oops. So first off, I want to acknowledge uh, co-authors on this um, that are USGS and also University of Alaska Fairbanks who contributed to the work. And then um, acknowledge some of the other folks in Alaska that uh, were involved in, in helping make this study uh, happen. Alaska is a different a difficult environment to work in. Um, it's remote terrain, rugged terrain, uh, and so one of the reasons why the USGS did this study here in Alaska was try to push that te te technology from a more comfortable and well-studied place to, to places we hadn't gone before. Uh, and in particular, Alaska, with its uh, low solar angle and steep terrain in places, you're challenged in getting good reflectance signatures that you can then interpret. So that was one of the main motivators behind doing the work in Alaska. So what I'll touch on in this talk uh, is a little bit of background on spectral features and how you use those to identify minerals, very brief, uh, and talk a little bit about the study area. It's a porphyry copper system. Uh, two um, deposits uh, that are most well known, well studied are Orange Hill and Bond Creek. Uh, and we'll touch on the multi-scale hyperspectral imaging that was collected during the course of the project, from airborne to the field-based down to uh, laboratory-leveled scanning of hand samples. And we'll get the opportunity then to compare how the mineral identifications agree or are consistent uh, across those levels. And we'll discuss a little bit about the uh, application of this technology to higher latitudes for exploration. So a little bit of background. Uh, what are the basic fundamentals of, of identifying minerals with spectroscopy? Well, uh, the chemical bonds in any material absorb energy, sunlight, longer wavelengths, in specific wavelength regions. And if you take a spectrum of a material you don't know its composition and compare it to the spectra of materials where you do know the composition, you can match based on the, where those spectral features occur and where the shapes are, match them to your library and identify material. So here's just a visual example of that. This is a measurement in Yellowstone National Park. And uh, one of the things that always amazed me when I first started with the USGS was that I could just take this to one of the spectroscopists and they would key in right away and say, oh yeah, there's your kaolinite. That's what's occurring in this area. So just in a uh, general sense, what we've done as a community is build a whole series of reference materials and libraries, both in the USGS, in Australia, and many other people in industry have created these libraries where you can start to associate these bumps and wiggles in the spectrum to their composition. The system that I used for this study is the PRISM software, which is a set of uh, IDL routines that I wrote to analyze the Afghanistan uh, high map collection. Uh, and this is a freely available software. You can download it. It works as a plug into NV. And there's a standalone version of that as well that you can use without an NV license. The core um, function of that that I'll talk about the results from is the MICA program. It's the material identification and characterization algorithm. 
So just as a visual, how the MICA program works is it uh, takes the spectrum of an unknown, unknown. This is an average spectrum. Compares it to the spectra of known materials in specific wavelength regions and using what's called continuum removal to isolate a feature and then some linear regression, you can determine what is the best match and so what material is the predominant material in that um, spectrum that you measure. Now, the wavelengths we've been talking about, the visible through the short wave infrared, they're good for some minerals. They're not good for all minerals. The primary rock forming minerals, quartz and feldspars, you don't really get diagnostic absorption features in this visible to short wave infrared region. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more in the next talk about how we can use the longer wavelengths like the thermal to, to look uh, at those minerals. So we collected the imaging spectroscopy da data over this study area. This is uh, about 450 kilometers from Anchorage. Uh, there's the Nebesna Pluton here in the northern part in the magenta tones um, that sits north of the Rangelia terrain here in the green. There's some Nikolai greenstone and some uh, limestone metasediments in the area as well. Here's uh, some of the view of some of the mineralization. This is looking down California Gulch, which sits on the uh, eastern, or sorry, the western edge of that study area. And here we can see there's a highly silicic intrusive in the foreground here and beyond it you have a quartz diorite, which is host of most of the mineralization in that area. Here's just a look at some of the stockwork veining and some of the mineralization, uh, calcopyrite uh, rich vein here and a moly rich vein here on the, on the right. This is the uh, Bond Creek deposit here in the foreground. In the background, we have the Rangelia terrain. Uh, and you can see this is some of the steepness of the terrain here. So you can imagine with the low sun angle, some of these slopes are not getting very well illuminated. So it is really difficult to get a good signature. Um, and I won't have time to go into the methods that we use to, to derive that, but there are some radiative transfer programs out there at Core 4, which can help you work with this kind of terrain. And then we used um, some field-based measurements to improve those uh, radiative transfer results. So here's the data that we collected that spanned a whole range of spatial scales from six meter pixels down to half a millimeter pixels. The spectral characteristics also ranged quite widely from 16 nanometer sampling interval and band pass, which is relatively coarse compared to uh, you know, finer sampling with a, something like an ASD at one nanometer sampling interval and about five nanometer band pass in the visible near infrared. So something we had to do was account for all these changes in spectrometer characteristics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Along with the spectral work, we did um, field geologic work, geochemical uh, analyses, XRD, and electron microprobe to, to validate what we were doing with the spectral work. So as I mentioned, we have all these different spectrometers. We need to make sure that when we're comparing them to our reference library that we're comparing apples to apples. So with each spectrometer, we compare or we make measurements of some reference standards that we have very well characterized with super high resolution spectrometers. And we determine the wavelength and bandpass characteristics of the different sensors we're using. And that way, we can take our reference spectral library and convolve it to match the characteristics of each spectrometer, and you take that spectrometer data and compare it to that convolved library, so you're comparing apples to apples. You're not trying to compare coarse resolution data to fine resolution data. So with that MICA algorithm, um, we can generate a lot of output. We, in this analysis, we looked at 77 different materials, most of those minerals, and compared each pixel in the data to those 77 reference materials. In order to visualize that, we ended up grouping those into the groups that you see here. There were other, of course, minerals that were, uh, the, the detection was attempted, but they just, they didn't map in the area. Uh, so I'm gonna be showing you maps that have these uh, mineral classes in them. And I'll mention that these reference spectra we use came from the most recent version of the USGS Spectral Library version seven, uh, which was released uh, this year. 
uh, and has a lot of these new higher resolution spectral measurements that work with today's modern imaging spectrometers. So it's got some improved spectra of what, over what you've seen in the past. So just a, a quick uh, comment on uh, the XRD work that we did. The XRD work we did on about 50 hand specimens confirmed the presence of these minerals that are listed here. And we didn't see in those results any other minerals that would be spectrally active in this wavelength region. So the XRD generally supports the, the results that we have from the spectral data. So here's a map of the focal area of this study. This is the Orange Hill deposit here, the Bond Creek deposit over here. These are the uh, mineral classes. If I overlay some of the geologic line work uh, in white here, we can see the Nebesda Pluton here to the north. And then down here, we have the Rangelia terrain. So generally, we see some of the same minerals occurring across each uh, area. Of course, there's no smoking gun. Some of my economic geologists looked at this and the uh, colleagues, and they're like, Meh. You know, where's the, you know, where's the bullseye that tells me exactly where to go? Well, it's not ever that simple. So generally, what, what do we see in association with the lithology? Epidote and chloride in red here associated with the Nikolai greenstone. Uh, the green tones here, the darker green, are limestones where we have the metasediments. Down here in the Rangelia terrain, we have a, quite a mix of white mica and white mica plus various clays. Up in the Pluton, we have dominantly white mica with some uh, mixtures of clinochlor and white mica occurring. Okay, so that, that result, when we looked at that, we did see some association. Um, it may be difficult to see at this scale, but we do see some association with the altered zone mapped by Richter in the 70s, where we have a white mica core, and then it's flanked by a clinochlor plus white mica, and then grading into uh, clinochlor plus white mica and some uh, carbonate. So it kind of points us towards, uh, sorry, points us towards uh, some indicators of, of association with this clinochlor plus white mica class, which is only occurring in, near these altered zones um, in the mineralized areas. But we also are aware of these uh, white mica chemical changes that can uh, occur in these types of systems. And so we looked at that as well. And so this is a, just a quick um, example of white mica wavelength position, which occurs around 2200 nanometers as it relation, relates to the aluminum composition in the octahedral site. Uh, so as you increase, um, Aluminum, you decrease the, the wavelength position. So that's what we look to see uh, we, if we could find in the data, uh, the high map data. And I won't have to skip the details here of how we make the determination of the wavelength position. Uh, but when we did that, we started to see a much better association between uh, the wavelength position of these white micas, uh, higher wavelength in the warmer tones, the yellows and the reds, and in relation to geochemical anomalies in stream sediments of copper, moly, and gold. So where we have the warm tones, we have the higher concentrations of those elements. Uh, so that's a, a very good result. What we did was then go out and test that in follow-on field work and fi find high elevate, elevated uh, copper, moly, and gold in a couple of the other locations that are outside the previously mapped um, Porphyry area. And here's some examples of, uh, here's an example of that um, that we were seeing with this quartz sulfide vein um, here with uh, calcopyrite in it. Uh, so we did have good use of this hyperspectral imaging and the maps that were produced, particularly the white mica maps, to guide us towards mineralized areas that weren't previously uh, recognized, either because uh, they weren't mapped or in some cases they were covered with snow and ice from the glacier and the glacier had retreated and now it was exposed and we were able to image those areas and find these signatures. So now focusing in on the other levels of spectroscopy, we're gonna look at the Orange Hill area, which is this little hill here and compare that to <coughs> the, the higher mountain terrain there. 
Uh, here we use the high spec system of the University of Alaska Fairbanks to image this westernmost exposure. Uh, we use some ASD measurements to use an empirical line correction to, to co convert that to reflectance. And we did various scans. It was super cloudy, very poor illumination. It was a real challenge to get good reflectance data. Um, typically, we only like to work with great data, right? We don't want to work with, you know, data that's sketchy. But in this case, uh, because it's so difficult to get around Alaska, we were forced to do that. We had one day to try to make this happen. And so we uh, collected what we could. We look at the different scans and the mineralogy that's coming out. We see there's some variation, mostly because there's very low signal to noise in, in the individual scan that we collected on that day. But when we pull all the good parts of those scans together and then do a little bit of spatial averaging, here's a two by two pixel average, we start to see consistent and good non-noisy detections of mineralogy. Uh, and these correspond with what we were detected with the high map data. And so here's those two uh, compare. This is the high specs here, field level data, and the high map data here on the top. Generally, the same types of minerals are coming out. The distributions are a little bit different. Um, there's more gypsum occurring or being detected in the high map data compared to the high specs data. We tried coarsening the data spectrally and spatially, the high specs to match the high map. That didn't really shift the, the detections to match exactly the high map. So we think this is more a function of the position of observation, of viewing from above as opposed to the side. At least that's our, our working interpretation right now of why there's some shift in the relative proportions of these. But generally, the identifications are, are corresponding. When we look at the white mica wavelength positions, we see that the high specs data are more in the warmer tones. The high map data are more in the cooler tones. We see some of the same trends. There's cooler tones here on the uh, southern side of the mountain. So those trends kind of match, where we have higher wavelength here and the lower wavelength here. Uh, what we attribute this shift to, we, we did some experiments with the reference spectra we have for different muscovites, a different wavelength position. And what we see is when you have a, a more spectrally coarse instrument, you can see, in this case, a 1.4 nanometer shift uh, to shorter wavelengths with your high map data. So these, this discrepancy here of about a nanometer is consistent with what you would expect because of the spectral characteristics of the sensors. So the last set of uh, results I want to talk about are things that we did at the laboratory level with hand samples that were collected from the Orange Hill area. Uh, and here we used the CoreScan Hyperspectral Core Imager Mark III system uh, to again look at the predominant mineralogy in the hand samples as well as the Muscovite uh, or white mica wavelength position. And in particular to key in on that and associate that with aluminum composition from electron microprobe results. So here's the um, subsample of all the samples that were scanned. This is about 30 samples. On the left, we have the predominant mineral mapping. On the right, we have the Muscovite or the white mica wavelength position mapping. And we can see for all these samples and the other 30 some samples, again, we're pulling out the same predominant mer mineralogy, mostly white mica, types of chlor different types of chlorides and chlor plus white mica and various clays in there. So the, the results uh, that were also compared to XRD really helped support the mapping we did at the coarse scale with the high map airborne data. At the uh, my, wh white mica wavelength position mapping, we see generally the same range. And they all fall within this sort of 2199 to 2207 range that was mapped with high map. However, in the hand sample level, we start to see things uh, at higher wavelengths uh, than we saw at high map, the high map resolution. And uh, we're, we're, we're attributing that to the fact that at the coarser scale, you get a lot of mixing of these different compositions. And so you're generally not seeing the extremes. You're seeing the, the middle ground. Uh, when we look even uh, finer, these are billets cut from different rock samples, um, we can see some of these variations are really uh, 
really quite rapid over a millimeter to centimeter scale. Uh, so within one section of rock, you can have quite a variation in, in white mica composition, or at least, getting ahead of myself, at least wavelength position of these white micas. And so that gives us the opportunity to then look at the aluminum composition of these white micas in these various spots on, on the four billets we examine and see if there's a relationship uh, between the wavelength position and, and the aluminum composition. And when we plot it up, similar to how Greg Swayze plotted it up for samples from Cooperite, Nevada, we have aluminum composition in the octahedral site on the x-axis, wavelength here on the y-axis. We see a good, strong uh, inverse relationship between increasing aluminum and uh, wavelength position. Uh, it just seems it's just five nanometers shifted from, from what Greg reported in his, uh, his study in Cooperite. Um, but the, the slope is, is very similar. What the reason is for the shift, we're still investigating why it would be shifted five nanometers. We've explored several possibilities. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we, we do fine characterization of our spectrometers to make sure we know where their wavelength positions are. So we've accounted for that. Um, so it's not due to a spectrometer uh, shift. So this is still under, uh, under investigation as to uh, why there's the shift, but there certainly is the trend as we would expect. Some things we saw with the core scan data that we don't see at the coarser scales are some minerals that are just in low abundance on a, a six meter pixel scale. Here's molybdenite uh, spectra extracted from some rock samples and here's a reference uh, Ward scientific sample of molybdenite. You can see those spectral features due to the uh, electronic transitions in the visible region. And you can generate the map of the uh, distribution of molybdenite within the rock. Uh, so here you can get, you know, more directly at what you're interested in uh, at that course, at that uh, level of data that you can't get to from the coarser scale. So in summary, uh, in terms of the Orange Hill Bond Creek area, we saw some spatial associations between the clinochlor plus, specific clinochlor plus white mica classes uh, that uh, are in agreement with uh, porphyry mineralization in the rocks and, and it, that was across both terrains. So it wasn't just a lithology driven change in the mineralogy, it crossed uh, both uh, the Nebesna pluton and the um, Rangelia terrain. The longer wavelength positions of muscovite are a potential vector for mineralization and our follow-up sampling in areas of longer wavelength uh, def w had a confirmation of that in, in two of the areas that we sampled. We only sampled two, so two for two. Better than one from one. Uh, and then the spectral identifications of minerals and mineral chemistry uh, and the white mica wavelength position were consistent across the scales of the spectrometer accounting for some of the differences in the, in the uh, spectral characteristics. So finally, in terms of future directions, and these are things that maybe we'll hear about in the next decadal um, conference, uh, the geologic tectonic settings of, of parts of Alaska are permissive of, in some case known to host, other deposits where this technology could be used and other higher latitudes have um, these types of deposits where this technology could be applied to. So um, it seems that there are some potential places where this type of study could, could be useful for de defining alteration footprints. And for um, accessible areas, our, our experience with the field-based imaging spectroscopy indicate that it's a potential alternative. If you can't do an airborne study, maybe you can get a field-based spectroscopy study done for selected outcrops. Um, the caveat being, um, we didn't geocode our data, so you need some other data to geocode, something like a ground-based LIDAR or a drone-based photogrammetry to do a uh, surface model to drape your, uh, to drape the hyperspectral data on and guide your geologist to, to the right sampling locations. And one thing I didn't uh, address here is there's a lot of vegetation uh, covering uh, Alaska, so for the 
the rugged terrain where you have lots of exposures, yes, there are potentially other targets that you could use this technology for. But we really need to address uh, how to look at vegetation spectral, spectral signatures that might be related to the underlying altered rock. So with that, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Ray.